All right. So this is the um, Christmas 2023 edition of um, the Mer Ligase Open Source Antibiotics Meeting. Here is the um, agenda. And, and some of the usual things today, as well as some other attendees, it, it would be uh, it would be good to hear from as well. So, um, as is traditional, uh, it will be it will be great if um, those of us who have any new experimental data to report would be happy to to do that. Um, obviously, from my own selfish perspective, um, I'm interested in. Anything that's happening on the um, multi-targeting compounds that we've been working on a little bit, uh, the chemistry of which we've been working on a little bit at UCL, um, and then I've installed on the on the key thing uh, any follow-up on the AZ contributed compounds. Um, Warwick team, I didn't want to put you on the spot, but if if you were happy to report back on anything that's happened in the last month, that would be a great start. Yeah, certainly. All right, shall uh, I stop? So, right, I'm going to have to share my screen, I think. Okay, so can we all see that? Yep. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to talk about is some work that we did this year with um, a summer student called Henry Way, who was from St. Andrews, who we essentially had as an intern in the lab for about um, eight weeks, uh, working on uh, merligases. Um, and really, like that, I'm going to start really with a slide, which uh, the next slide he said, which basically shows that that all the controls that we do in all these assays basically use a non um ATP analog, which is ADPCP, which is actually covered by me, unfortunately. Um, if I can just put this on um, slide display. Yeah, that would be bigger first as well. Yeah, great, great. Okay, and let me just minimize this all, excuse me. <laughs> right, okay. <clears throat> so, ATPCP, which is this non hydrolyzable analog of ATP, with a non cleavable bond between the beta and gamma phosphorus atoms, where there's an oxygen replaced by a methylene, gives essentially single or sub micromolar um, IC50s against all the molar gases, with the single exception of MERD, where we've always had a much higher measured IC50. But the point is that this. Although ADPCP itself is not a drug, it is a very, very efficient multi-targeting molecule. So that tells you everything you need to know about ADPCP binding, but doesn't really tell you too much about ATP binding. So if I go to the next slide. <clears throat> so this, these are the kinetics of utilization of ATP in a Mercy assay on the uh, left-hand side. And on the right, an E. coli uh, Merdi assay. And the point I want to make here is that if you increase the ATP concentration sufficiently, you drive the enzyme into a state of substrate inhibition. And what we mean by that, if you look at the bottom left-hand side, is that you form a complex of uh, the ligase with not just one molecule of ATP, but two. And the likelihood is given that these proteins bind two nucleotides, one UDP-based and the other one adenosine-based, that there is the possibility that ATP would actually bind to both subsites sub, sub in the active site if its concentration was high enough, and this is the origin of the substrate inhibition. So working with that, me and Henry <clears throat> asked the following question. So We've been really interested in multi-targeting based upon targeting different gene products. And our paradigm for this are things like beta-lactams and d cyclosyrian which target uh, numerous PBPs or DDL uh, or alanine racemase respectively. And their potency derives from their ability to take out different gene products. But the question we really had was, if we were targeting 
or considering two binding sites with the same molecule, could that um, could that facet of multiple targeting of the same protein at different sites present a similar hurdle to the evolution of resistance? So, with that question in mind, uh, we started out with the molecule at the top right hand corner, which is adenosine tetrapolysoadenosine, which turns out to be a particularly poor inhibitor of MERC uh, and MERD, uh, um, does appear to have a, a, a 0.2 millimolar IC50 against MERE um, and some activity towards MERF. But the point is that these interactions are fairly weak. But the other molecule that is available that is related to uh, AP4A is a molecule that has a uridine in place of one of the adenosines. So if I go to the next slide. So uridine tetraphosphoadenosine, basically. Now, this turned out to be considerably more potent uh, and, in actual fact, against MER-E, uh, generates an IC50 of 5 micromolar. Um, and in addition, MER-C was also more sensitive to this particular molecule. So there appears to be uh, an interaction with uh, this molecule, which has an adenosine at one end and a uridine at the other, and mer -E appears to be very, very sensitive to it. So, if we make comparisons, the substitution of a uridine for an adenosine in AP4A reduces the IC50 about 47-fold for MER E and about 7-fold for MER C. So, this does raise a question. Um, are we actually able to target both binding sites? And if we are, is there any utility in doing this? And also, how does this, how does this work? So the four segments labeled AU, 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 and AU, they're meant to represent a MER ligase, adenosine binding site, and uridine binding site. Um, and one possibility is that UP4A that we've we're using could actually span both sites. I don't believe it's big enough to do that because if you look at the panel below, which is basically the disposition of UDP monad dipeptide and ADP in the active site of TB um, uh, E, that distance is about 30 odd am 31 Armstrongs. And in actual fact, if you look at crystal structures of C, D, E, and F, where you can make the same measurement between the ribose rings of the adenosine substrate and the uridine substrate, you're talking about distances of about 20 to 30. So the likelihood is that the potency of um, UP4A in Murray probably doesn't relate to it laying across the active site in that way, which leaves the possibility that it's binding exclusively to one part of the active site that binds the ATP or one part of the active site that binds the um, uridine peptide glycan precursor. Uh, or, of course, uh, it can bind independently to both. So we've started to do some work looking at the mechanistic basis of this inhibition. And we see on the right-hand side, if you look at IC50s of different concentrations of the UDP substrate, um, that we're looking at an inhibitor that appears to be competitive with the UDP dipeptide substrate, implying that it occupies um, or is mutually exclusive to the binding of substrate at that site. Um, we have to complete our analysis with respect to competition uh, with ATP. Um, but th this is where we where we are at the moment. And going forward with this particular piece of work, um, we've basically uh, contacted a company called Biolog, uh, who are specialists in generating um, various derivatives and nucleotides um, and have 
inquired, which uh, and the answer was yes, they can make a variety of mixed uh, nucleotides with one, two, three, four, five, or six phosphates between the two, and we'll be pursuing their activity against um, the myeligases within the pseudomonas pathway. Um, we unfortunately don't have any crystallographic data to back any of this up yet, but it's obvious that we would like to. Um, and we believe that there is potential for the design of molecules that may potentially be able to target both sites within uh, a particular myeligase and therefore within the same um, peptide sequence, protein sequence, effectively multi-target within it. And that's that's it. Thank you, Adrian. Um, question, if the molecules are acting independently through each sort of head group, why can't you just add the two of them together rather than covalently linked? Well, that, yeah, I mean, that that is another experiment coming up because a prediction would be that, for example, UDP would vastly potentiate the inhibitory potency of ADP if you were to think, to think along those lines. Um, I mean, I, I guess what we would like in the end of the day, when we get some crystallography behind this, is the possibility of designing something that is more drug-like because you don't really want all those phosphates there. Um, but uh, it would actually, potentially, might be a, an interesting therapeutic, well, an interesting approach. Yeah, great. I mean, one of the reasons we went after this was the struggle that we've been having with trying to get the crystallography data. And we thought, well, if we can get something that binds both sites, maybe we can trap, we can trap that into a structure. Um, so we, that was, that was, you know, an, an additional rationale as to why we did this over the summer. So this is work that was done last summer. It's just Adrian's just tidied up uh, to to preserve really. Um, I did try to do some, try to co crystallize this already uh, with you before A, uh, but it didn't work because mirror E is a bit more uh, picky. <laughs> and we were having a lot of issues with the temperature. So um, I need to give it another try now and, and see if it would work with the incubator. Because we got now another incubator um, and we'll have a second one coming. So, yeah. Right, I was right. just going to say that if I, because I'm trying to get access to a um, different SPR instrument uh, that I could use a different injection mode, and this could be visible in a different injection mode, not for the one that we got here. So if I get access, I could also try that. Right. Yeah. Uh, and just one final additional bit about biochemistry. Uh, this week, we've managed to place an advert for an, a new biochemist. Uh, not to replace the old one we've got, but to uh, add to the old one we've got with a, a new, younger version uh, to uh, <laughs> help out with extra pair of hands. Uh, that's that's the plan. Hopefully, we can recruit them in the early part of the new year uh, to to help push things forward, which we know is a bit of a bottleneck. But um, hopefully, that'll help solve that. Great. All right. Yeah. All right. So. Um... Just on the uh, so the the multi-targeting compounds, the atom-wise and the enamine warwick collection compounds. I guess am I, I my memory is hazy. Are we wait, are we are we waiting on IC fifties for those, or was it just the crystallography we're waiting for those? Sorry, I forget. IC fifty and crystals, right? Okay, oh. all right. Yeah, and um, and I guess I just wanted to be sure that that's still in the pipeline so that we can you know, assess which molecules are the most promising. Um, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. And 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 the event. Sorry, sorry, Karen, Lauren. Sorry. So I've been doing crystallography as well on these compounds, obviously. So yeah. I've been trying to do some, well, I tried um, in situ crystallography as well, just to see if the penetry was doing something. Um, yeah, so I did collected a lot of data sets uh, with the soaking uh, for mu D, uh, mu E doesn't like that much uh, in doing the temperature diffraction, so I didn't proceed with that one. 
um, yeah, and the new crystals they are not soaking any compounds in. So yeah, we are in the same on that. But I did set up new crystal place with different conditions to see if anything grows. Uh, and now the beam line is um, is off, so I can't test anything until the new year. But it's gonna be very easy. As soon as I see crystals, I just put them in the queue for testing. Um, and that's it. And I'm also talking to the um, uh, time resource crystallography team, and I will also start uh, optimizing crystals for that as well. So we can look at more um, smaller crystals and then do um, very time resource uh, comparison of soaking and see if we see something going in. Yeah. All right. Um, when's the beam line back up? Uh, Mid January. Okay. I think it was the 18th. Yeah, like completely back, uh, back half. Yeah. 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 All right. I'm going away for 10 days in January. So I'm hoping when I'm back, I can get free sun sent crystals. <laughs> yeah. Good time for a vacation. Um, and uh, yeah. So just on, on the crystallography front, um, we, we'd we hope that Scott will be able to come along to the meeting, but he couldn't make it um, to update us on what he's been doing with the compound J06. Um, but I, I don't suppose he's updated through you, has he, or anything? Because I guess he was doing that independently of you, right? Right. Yeah, he's at a different site, different yeah. state. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, all right. Well, hopefully he can come to the next one. Um, but did you want to update on anything, or is it nothing new this, this month? I don't have anything on my side except for, I don't know if Amy is here. Um, Amy is work. Amy is yeah. uh, a, yeah, a person. Okay, I don't know. I Amy, you were getting some proteins to Scott. Besides that, uh... yeah. So I had uh, just uh, got them out of our freezer stocks and sent them down to Scott. Yeah. So yeah, All right. this as well the UMI the substrate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's they, right. You sent Scott the UMA, I think, last yes. a few weeks ago. So, yeah. Yeah. So, so sorry, I don't have any updates, yeah, um, but I do know, know that they're busy know. working on it. <laughs> and okay. they're, they're pretty yeah, okay. good about telling us when they get something. So, yeah. um, it typically means us that no news is uh, bad news. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <made> them later. <laughs> or, or it's just no news. Like, they don't know yet. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll be sure to keep everyone on the invite list for the meetings for 2024. So everyone knows when these are. All right. Um, so any um all right, so any queries on what we've heard so far from anybody who hasn't had a chance to ask a question yet? Okay. Um all right. So the um you hang, did you want to say anything about chemistry? I think you just posted something to the site. Oh, maybe it's down the page. Oh yeah. Did you want to update? Because your your target list here is the guanidiniums and pyridiniums, right? Um, yeah. did you want to say anything about this in terms of when compounds might be available for shipping, stuff like that? Uh yeah, sure, absolutely. Uh so the first part, oh uh, oh Matt, would you mind to scroll up a little bit? Uh, uh, yeah, so the first part is the condition screening. So it took me a while to find the right uh, solvent that's not only suitable for uh, the the, part, uh, tri uh, the trial parts. Uh, for example, this uh, cyclohexyl uh, uh, building block, uh, but also for the sister uh, for the AstraZeneca cores that we are we've been modifying. So uh, now we found uh, ambutanol as the best solvent to uh, do the guanidylation. Uh, well, uh, in the literature, DCM was the best, but uh, yeah, uh, ambutanols have now been picked for our systems, uh, for our AZ systems. Uh, now we can scroll down a little bit. Uh, so the the next part was the uh, was a old compound I've synthesized and uh, sent to Warwick B 
before, but I because the protocol has already been set up, so I decided to uh, synthesize this uh this compound. Sorry, I didn't uh, I didn't use some uh number to uh, I didn't number it, but uh, yeah, on the top on the top right, uh, this AZ Amy, uh, which was a brand new compound. I decided to scale up a little bit, uh, make uh, make around like fifty milligrams, to to try out the best condition for the guanidolation, and uh, through the whole process below that structure, you can see I basically made it. Uh, just need further purification when when I'm back. Uh, should be ready in like a week or so uh then the next part is the az5 and i5 part uh i've synthesized uh six grams of the starting material the the aiming uh the uh the aiming uh the die aiming bulk protective version but uh, it's racemic uh but we decided to send it anyway uh uh once we've made this box protected AZ5 and I5 uh, racemic version. Uh, the, the thing is, well, uh, it was uh, this condition was working uh, before the microwave was uh, got broken, but after it was fixed, <laughs> I, I still haven't tried out the best condition to actually get some uh, box protected version of this compound out. Uh, uh well, I don't know what happened to the machine, but uh, none of the conditions were working anymore. Uh, I've tried uh other conditions like uh normal heating or high pressure tube, but not working. So uh, because I got loads of the starting materials, I maybe I can just uh, make do with this low yield and just keep uh accumulated then until we get that 15 milligrams for the whole microbiology assay <laughs> that that's very stupid uh method but uh yeah sometimes yeah then uh then we can scroll down a little bit so so these two uh uh i decided to make them at the same time uh because first of all the the First of all, the math, uh, the protocol is very easy to establish. Uh, so one of the compounds, the top right compound was AZ compound thirteen. I and I believe, uh, Joe has, uh, uh we have coll uh, collaborated with Anime and we've bought it, and we've sent it to Warwick already. But I just want to make an send it. If 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 we need more, just save it as a stock. Um, there's a isomer. We also have the starting material to, uh, yeah, to 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 make. So we we can just send this for fun. Uh, the structure is it compound thirteen isomer. Yeah. So uh, the reason I do these uh these two reactions or uh there's another reason for me to do these two reactions is because we have the bulk protected diamine version of this uh of this building block. Uh if you guys can see the the yellow colored building blocks, uh we have the uh we have bought the uh diamine version of it. Uh one of the aiming was protected. Box protected. The other, the other ones, uh, the hydroxyl group can be replaced with the amine. So I just want to try out the conditions for those two reagents as well. So we can just attach those two directly, uh, in the new year soon. So, uh, that's the reason. And that that two building, those two building blocks were quite expensive. So I just want to make sure we got the best conditions, uh, before we actually do it. Uh, the last part would be the old samples in stock. Uh, yeah, basically we have some in stock. I've made it before I leave G25. Uh, before I leave UCL. Uh, sorry, leave UK. Uh, yeah. So 
waiting for a purification and it will be quick just four quick reverse reverse phase purifications and uh, they will be ready uh, hopefully i can ship a lot of compounds in time i will say uh before the uh, by the end of january uh, i'll try to reach that deadline if that's, that's a nice. good plan or yes. i can just send separately yeah. like uh, if you uh, for example once i made like a four samples i just send them right through so guy you guys can keep it uh keep keep it keep doing things uh that that's also a possibility if you guys need it uh we can do that all right thanks yeah. thanks yeah. thanks yeah whatever you prefer <laughs> <laughs> yeah thanks. Right. well okay i guess all at once is good because then we can make direct comparisons within the same experimental runs That's true. yeah all right <clears throat> okay great thanks you hang any questions on the chemistry All right. Um, and then uh, just some other things here. Um, so, uh, yeah, I've cleared up this agenda uh, item here about the computational modeling. So I'll try put on the list of things to write up over the Christmas holidays, um, something about the modeling competition, which we ran, trying to get that into shape. Um, we on a late draft of the CC for car proposal. Again, that's on me. And um, I'll try and work with Joe to to generate the final version of that so that we can submit it. Um, we've heard already from Adrian um, about this. And then um, I was hoping that uh, Guy, if you are still with us and able to share some uh, slides that, that introduce you to the group about what you're doing with the with the TB targets, if you're happy to present. Yeah, sure. Uh, let me just... Okay, so um, okay, and everybody see great, yeah, okay, well, so for those uh we haven't met yet um. I started working here with, uh, with Todd uh, in uh, October. I got a, a fellowship here in the School of Pharmacy. And uh, the idea of this uh, fellowship was to uh, build it on, on the data already collected for the inhibitors against uh, bacteria, more uh, ligases, and try to uh, transfer this knowledge and apply for the drug design for some uh, uh, inhibitors against the uh, mycobacter mycobacter mycobacterium tuberculosis uh, uh, strain, basically. Uh, the idea was, uh, because uh, my expertise is basically on uh, tuberculosis drug discovery, uh, since my master PhD postdoc, my previous postdoc, was always in TB drug discovery, so I thought I could maybe uh, harness this, uh, this uh, background and expertise and try to uh, apply this on the development of some inhibitors. So basically the idea, well, uh, not sure if everyone is uh, updated on the uh, epidemiology of TB. So basically uh, TB is again, uh, the, word, the, the lead infectious killer in the world after uh, COVID-19 is actually um, slowing down after the, the pandemic. So this is the reason why uh, we should actually develop new drugs for TB because uh, uh, only in 2022, we had more than 10 million new cases of TB worldwide and 1.3 uh, million deaths uh, from the disease. But of course, the worst problem on TB is the uh, resistant bacteria, uh, not just TB, any, any infectious disease, of course. But in TB, it's particularly uh, uh, severe because uh, for the treatment of the multi, uh, for the resistant case, you need the uh, a cocktail of different drugs, usually five, six, or, or uh, seven different drugs. And of course, you have a lot of problems uh, with the treatment, which is the of uh, more resistant and also the uh, side effect of the drugs. Uh, and as you can see, tuberculosis is among one of 
the uh, dead list. Uh, one, one of the top cause of death worldwide, it's, uh, it kills more than HIV currently. And uh, from the infectious diseases, they're actually the worst. Uh, okay, so moving on. So basically the idea of the, this project is to shift from the uh, bacteria to the to mycobacterial heats based on the, the inhibitors that we that you guys have already uh, identified. Uh, different from uh, traditional gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Sorry. Different from uh, gram positive and negative bacteria, uh, the cell wall of, myco of mycobacteria are a bit different because they have the mycolic acid layer, which is a, a, an additional layer compared to the gram negative cell, for example. So on during the drug design, um, usually the drugs available for TB, they are quite different uh, from the uh, traditional antibiotics. And that's one of the reasons that most of the TB drugs, they don't work against gram positive or gram negative uh, bacteria. And the, the opposite is also true. Uh, the reason for this is this is, is because the uh, cell wall of the mycobacteria is much more uh, lipophilic than the gram negative and of course the gram positive uh, bacteria. And therefore compounds, uh, willing to, trans, uh, to cross this membrane must have a higher lipophilist compared to the tr traditional antibiotics. So for example, on the case of gram negative bacteria, uh, it's quite established that having positively charged groups in a compound, uh, it's actually good to uh, retain this compound uh, uh, in, the, in the membrane of gram negative bacteria. But this approach, uh, it doesn't work against TB, um, and um, the reason the reason is that's because uh, first, in order to get to the uh, positively negative, uh, positively charged negative uh, uh, parts of the membrane, you have to first cross the mycolic acid, and uh, the positively charged in compounds would be a problem basically. Uh, so now, going back to uh, the Marley gases, uh, I. Being, uh, so in the beginning of the project, I was doing some literature research on the actually compound that have been published or discovered uh, against the uh, TB more like gases. And uh, surprisingly, there are only a handful of compounds actually published. So most of the compounds have been uh, discovered against the uh, bacterial more like gases, but not mycobacterial. So this is just some of the compounds that uh, you can find out there in the, on the literature. But again, these compounds, most of them, they were never actually um, evaluated or screened against the enzymes. This, this is just basically uh, papers that they just uh, did uh, virtual screening and uh, they said that these compounds were actually, uh, they gave the, the best uh, uh, docking scores basically, but they never were, they, they were never evaluated actually. Uh, the thing is, most of these compounds that have been published, they have quite a similar structure with the natural substrate, with the which is the UDP. This is the the natural substrate for uh, TB or E. Yeah, so you can see that all all of these compounds they have these uh, very polar groups, which is in line with the uh, natural substrate. Uh, but that, that's a problem for TB because uh, uh, as you can see, these compounds are quite polar and uh, you cannot expect that these compounds will actually cross the TB, uh, the mycobacterial membrane, uh, which is the case. Uh, there is like loads of uh, uh, reviews and uh, analysis showing that compounds for TB should have higher log P values, values for example, usually around three and four, uh, which is different from uh, ground negative or gram positive. And these compounds here, they low, the, the lipophilus is quite low compared to what would be the optimal. So on the drug, during the drug design, I had that in mind. And uh, going over all the compounds that have been um, identified so far against the bacterial Merlai gases, uh, I decided basically to uh, Take with it one of these three compounds here uh, on the screen, 
because of the multi-targeting uh, activity that it, they showed basically. So, uh, so the decision was to choose between one of those three and to do uh, optimization on the structure uh, based on the TB uh, cell wall on the TB activity. So in order to choose one of them, I relied on um, in silico uh, screening, basically in silico uh, ADME and uh, a few other properties, basically just to pick the right one and to move on on the drug design. So the decision was basically uh, based on in silico and also the activity. Uh, AW17, it showed the activity against four of the more ligases and the other two against three of the more ligases. So they actually showed some sort of a multi-targeting activity. Um, so the, 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 yeah, the, the, when I was about to choose the red compound was based on the, uh, uh, on the physical chemical properties, basically. And based on the analysis, uh, A double 53 seemed, uh, the less problematic in terms of, uh, drug likeness properties, uh, as you can see on here on this table, um, it showed the least uh, predictable, of course, this is only predictable uh, uh, activity, of course. Uh, it showed the least uh, uh, predicted uh, toxicity. Uh, it didn't seem to aggregate in uh, assays. Um, it didn't, it, it only showed one alert on this uh, alarm uh, NMR, which is a, some, some sort of a, a pains filter as well, uh, different from the other two structures. Uh, it did show a better, a higher uh, lipophilicity. Um, and uh, of course, the problem was the solubility, which uh, Laura, uh, I think when she was doing the, the, the enzymatic assays, she was uh, dealing with this solubility problem. So my idea was to improve the solubility of this compound, uh, of the new series of compounds, basically, uh, and trying to keep the... Um, multi-targeting activity and also keeping the, the good lipophilicity. So basically it was, and an, an the idea is to design a new series that balance all the properties. And um, so we, we, we could have a more drug-like compound basically. And I did that uh, based on uh, virtual screening and some other computer aided uh, drug designer tools basically. So basically uh, the, I started off doing um, a virtual screening of uh, different uh, design compounds based on uh, the A double fifty three as a starting point. Um, I did several runs of talking, basically uh, using uh, uh, more more e ligase of mycobacterium tuberculosis, which we we had the the crystal structure already on PDB. So that was my starting point. Uh, after like dozens of uh, uh, docking runs, I got some uh, uh, really good compounds that showed not only good interaction with uh, the target, but also had good uh, uh, AD, ADME uh, properties. So basically that's how I prioritize the compounds to actually to go to the lab and make them, not just based on the docking results, but also the compounds that uh, showed some um, more promising in silico uh, uh, prediction on the uh, RDME analysis, basically. Yeah. So currently I'm uh, synthesizing, making uh, a couple of uh, new analogs. And uh, the next phase would be the uh, initial screen of a set of the final compounds against not just the uh, enzymes, but also the uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis, uh, the phenotypic strain. Because uh, um, I think this should be a, uh, uh, a parallel approach, not just uh, testing against the enzyme, but also at the same time testing against the bacteria, because uh, uh, oftentimes you find the uh, heat compounds against the enzyme, but when you test against the bacteria, it, it just uh, it doesn't work. So I think that's very important, uh, doing both at the same time to make sure that not only the compounds can actually target the the target the, the enzyme the that you, you you plan, but also the compounds can actually can get into the bacteria and cross all the membranes. Um, so yeah, that that would be the next step, and then that's when uh, Laura 
would uh, step in that we we had these discussions a couple of months ago that she uh, is going to start working uh, on the more like on the on the TB more like it as well and uh, I'll be happy to send her a few compounds uh, at least to check uh, if the drug design is going on this the right direction as soon as uh, she's got the the screen up and running um yeah, so basically the drug design was based on uh, virtual screening using the uh, more E from TB. So this is the picture of the natural substrate crystallized on the, within the active site of the enzyme. So this is the UDP. Um, I just wanted to uh, uh, bring your attention to this bit here of the molecule, which is the iridine that uh, uh, Adrian just... Uh, uh, highlighted on his on his previous talk as well. So basically, my, my, the idea was uh, to keep that bit on the final compounds because it seems that it had it it. I wouldn't say the pharmacophore of the compounds because they they haven't been tested, but it seems to be an important uh, uh, motive on the compound on the molecule. Uh, this is the picture on the same active site. Uh, with the A double fifty three docked, and uh, after several runnings of different docking using different properties, different uh, configurations, uh, they always the the software name I'm using Flare as a uh, as as the software for docking. the The docking pose was always very similar to um, what I'm showing right now, which is also in line with the uh, natural substrate. So basically the drug design was to keep uh, this bit here, uh, some sort of uh, uh, the same and try to improve uh, the other part of the molecules and see if we could gain a, a different uh, uh, interactions with the active site. So basically the idea was to change, yeah, let's see if I, if I can play, was to change the uh, sulfonamide uh, uh, subunit here with different substitute. Let's see, oh, it's not gonna, oh, yeah, yeah, just so this is just some of the uh different uh, substituents that I've been uh trying to dock in and see uh what sort of interaction I could get and also uh keep also in mind uh which of the substituents could have an uh, uh, increase in the lipophilics of the compound and also, uh, and most important, the solubility. Uh, after uh, doing these uh, several documents on, on the substituents, I also try to um, get some sort of uh, interactions with this bit here of the uh, activity side. Uh, that's why I did, uh, I decided to uh, in insert some uh, alkyl groups on this nitrogen here so I could get some interaction with these, uh, the, the, the solvent exposed air of the uh, enzyme of the receptor, basically. Uh, and this is just a, a, a peel of the um, different substitu substituents that I tried here on this bit here. Uh, as you can see, most of them, they gain an interaction with uh, amino acid here. Uh, which is quite, uh, uh, which seems, according to the docking score and the uh, binding uh, affinity, that uh, it could gain much more uh, uh, strong interactions than the uh, pyrantic compound, which is the A double 53. Uh, so yeah, basically these are just uh, some of the uh, compounds that I have designed and the, the, the colored ones are the ones that show the best uh, docking score basically, and also the uh, best uh, uh, ADME profile, uh, of course, the, the predicted one. Uh, yeah, so these are the, the ones that uh, I'm going to try to focus and uh, prioritize uh, to make the lab. Uh, of course, uh, I don't think I'm going to be making all of them at, the, at first. I'm going to try to prioritize maybe 10 or 15 and uh, send them to testing. And then uh, after the initial screen, see if the drug design uh, was actually in the right direction, then go back and uh, expand the library. Yeah, that's me. Thank you. That's great. Thanks, Guy. Um, any questions about this? I mean, of, of the, the cross screening of compounds is a given, which is great. And it's great to have Guy's inputs onto the 
the molecular modeling side of things too. Um, any queries from anybody? Yeah, actually I do. I, I, I'm Bob Hansen, I'm at Northeastern and I'm sort of coming in as a, as a chemist and I've talked with uh, Matt last, last year. B, I thought those were quite interesting. It looks like this is, was a follow, a big follow-up in the chemistry from uh, UA's uh, work from last year. Yeah. Two things. Mm -hmm. One is on the AW53. Yeah. Uh, and most of the work I've seen, pictures I've seen, that is a racemic compound at that alpha site. Mm -hmm. Do you know which of the two isomers R or S is the more effective binding agent? Uh, I, I've done uh, during the docking, I tested both uh, isomers and uh, they basically uh, gave me uh, the same uh, binding affinity, it's like very similar. Uh, it didn't okay, change anything. Okay, so there must be yeah. some space space in there in order to, that's being occupied. The second thing I noticed that you had proposed putting an alkyl substituent on that heterocyclic uh, yeah. ring. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. think that actually two things. One is that you show that it uh, may ha actually access and uh, if you can get the right group on there, it'll pr improve the, may improve the binding or selectivity yeah. specificity and all those. But the mm -hmm. other thing that that will do is I think that that may significantly improve solubility. Yeah, that's exactly And the exactly reason that. is those heterocyclic compounds really tend to self-associate. You know, and so you get that, you know, binding between the nitrogens mm -hmm. and the oxygens you know, to form that sort of, uh, and an aqueous solution, or if you try to get them into, take them out of aqueous solution, they tend to form dimers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I, I agree. But, I agree, yeah. But, yeah, yeah one of one of the reasons were to not just uh, improve the uh, lipophilis because you have like a bunch of carbons there, uh, but also the solubility, of course, yeah. And uh, yeah, as a, as a bonus, uh, according to the, the talk, of course, we get a new, uh, an extra uh, binding with one of the amino acids, yes. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, any uh, yeah, Bob, we're running out of time today, but maybe in the in the new year, if you could, if you're happy to update us on any northeastern developments on on students who may be willing to make compounds, that would be great. We haven't got time today, unfortunately. All righty, okay. Any um, any other questions about the TB side of things? I mean, it's an exciting extension of everything that we've been doing, so it's great that Guy's on this on the case. Yeah, thank you, Guy. Yeah, I'm as pressing yeah. pressing as we speak. So. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, uh, yeah, I'm not putting any pressure. I'm I'm still starting to get uh, the the synthesis actually up and running, and um, I finally starting getting some of the final. Uh, compounds and uh, yeah, I didn't show my presentation, but I'm also gonna when we start doing the testing, I'm also gonna send the compounds without the alkyl group on the uh, nitrogen that I showed. So we can actually test both and uh, uh, yeah, and see. And I think it'll be interesting to test against the uh, bacterial more like is as well, not just the TB1. Uh, yeah. Of course, depending on the availability of the the pro the, the enzyme. Yeah, and and That'll just great, just for the future, when we get to quite any microbiology, we've got uh, some expertise with T TB uh, microbiology models, at Warwick, so we can run uh, Mycobacterium bovis in macrophage and TB in macrophage and in animal models as well. So that's when we get to that point. Yeah, uh, we, that'll be great. We, yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, great. Um, so I just probably close. Um, I, as I mentioned at the beginning, I'll be sending out the invites for the 2024 meetings. Uh, there were no uh, pe people requesting a change in time or date, so I'll stick with that unless anyone's got any comments about that. Um, if you know of anyone who you think should be invited to the meetings, please let me know, um, and I can add them to the list. Thank you. All right. If All right. there's no other other business, then we can break for Christmas. Merry Christmas. Right, cool. Yeah. Merry Christmas, Thanks, everybody. Everyone. Happy Merry holidays. Christmas, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye.